begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of all the lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past and present. I would also like to extend that um, respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us today. As I said a little bit earlier, I'm the chapter chair for the ACT and region part of the uh, Australian Citizen Science Association. And this evening we have a presentation from Nadia Roslin, Frog ID Information Frog Conservation, um, through the, sorry, the presentation is Frog ID Information Informing Frog Conservation Through Citizen Science. Um, shortly I'll introduce Nadia, but first some housekeeping. Please stay muted throughout the presentation and for bandwidth considerations, you may consider turning off your video. If you have questions during the presentation, can you please enter them into the chat and we will ask them at the end of the session. The session today is being recorded and I'll make it available uh, in the next couple of days. Now to intro introductions. Nadia Roslin uh, is the project coordinator Frog ID for the Australian Museum Research Institute. Nadia is a biologist from the Australian bush capital, Canberra, um, with experience in coordinating projects on climate change, biology, and phenology for the research and not-for-profit -for sector. She previously studied a Bachelor of Science in Zoology at the Australian National University and a Master's of Science in uh, Tropical Marine Ecology at James Cook University in Townsville. Since joining the Australian Museum in 2020, she has had the pleasure of expanding her citizen science experience by working uh, as a project coordinator for Frog ID. Over to you, Nadia. Thank you, John. Let me get my slides up. You bring your slides up. Yep, yep. Done. Great. Hopefully, you can see my title slide with the big Frog ID logo on it. Yep. Wonderful. I can see it. Oh, wonderful. Thanks for that. Thanks for confirming. Sometimes it can be a bit troublesome. So, yes, thank you, John, for the introduction. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country which I'm presenting from today. The Gadigal people of the Eora Nation are the traditional owners of the land now called Sydney, and I wish to recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. I'm really excited to share information about the Frog ID project with you all today. Um, I'm really going to share what Frog ID is all about, why the Australian Museum started Frog ID, how important our frogs are, showcase some really cool frogs that you might hear from your backyards or bushland, um, and also share information about how you as individuals can join us and thousands of others across the nation in informing frog research and conservation simply through your smartphone. Today, I'm really presenting on a big team, big frog ID team at the Australian Museum. This is a herpetology team. Um, many of these people work on frog ID. Dr. Jody Rowley, Rowley is our lead scientist. Uh, we have several people working as research assistants um, and many of these people are Frog ID validators. So they listen to all the frog calls coming in through the Frog ID app and email you what species you have been recording. Um, so I really have to acknowledge that um, it's a big team that have helped me with these slides today and I'm really grateful to work with so many great people. Um, so you're probably all familiar with citizen science. It's a real buzzword at the moment. Uh, I just wanted to say that it's um, really uh, a really great way, another way of doing science. It's not tra um, replacing traditional scientific methods at all. It's really another way of doing science and really harnessing the skills and passion of the community to help answer questions about our world. And so I first started in citizen science when I worked at James Cook University um, I was uh, working um, with some scientists there looking at uh, rainforest biodiversity and a long-term monitoring project related to climate change. And so I had the really um, lucky opportunity to run these amazing trips out in the wet tropics um, in the rainforest looking for animals. It doesn't really sound like a job, but it's really, really fun <laughs> when you get out there looking for wildlife 
Um, and I had the opportunity to work with people from all over the world, many of them with no scientific background at all. And this uh, project really showed me the benefits of citizen science. We were able to collect a lot of data on large spatial and, and temporal scales across time and space. Um, and it really, really was rewarding to see people that were like me interested in the natural world that could contribute to um, real world science. Um, without even having a scientific background. So people from all walks of life um, can get involved in citizen, citizen science and um, really facilitate the information we need to conserve biodiversity. So that's a little bit how I got into citizen science, lots of volunteering to get me to my career path now. And so now I work at the Australian Museum Research Institute, as John uh, mentioned, and um, here we have a long history of citizen science projects and that we currently manage with collaborators, um, some, of the, some of Australia's most well-known and best loved citizen science projects, Frog ID being just one of these. Uh, for example, we were talking about Digivol a little bit earlier. Um, Digivol is an online digitization volunteer program where you can transcribe data from natural history collections. We also have the Australasian Fishes Project, which allows you to upload identifying and comment on the observations of Australian New Zealand fishes and investigate their growth and their pattern and different shapes. Um, so there's several citizen science projects based at the Australian Museum and Frog ID is our flagship citizen science project and that's been running since 2017. So our team at the Australian Museum established Frog ID for several reasons. A big reason is that frogs are in a lot of trouble globally. Unfortunately, there are hundreds of species thought to be extinct and many others threatened with extinction. And uh, when people think about endangered animals, they might think of big charismatic megafauna such as rhinos or tigers or other large iconic animals. But hopefully up to today, more of us will consider frogs. Although they're really tiny, um, they make up a huge part of the ecosystem and they're declining really rapidly and more rapidly than other animal groups like birds or mammals. So in recent years, scientists have um, been increasingly aware of the decline on numbers of frogs. 42% of all amphibians are threatened with extinction and many of them um, are facing a number of threats. So one of these is um, disease and you probably heard on the radio recently, Dr. Joe Rowley talking about this um, un un unfortunate mass mortality event happening on the eastern coast of Australia, um, which she thinks and some other experts across Australia think is related to disease. Um, there's also habitat loss and degradation in threatening frogs. Um, a frog's habitat is the environment which it feeds, it shelters and it breeds. So um, like many uh, other animals, it's, it's really threatened by habitat loss and degradation. Pollution is another threat. Frogs uh, generally spend a lot of their time or part of their life cycle in water. Um, most of the um, most frogs have their tadpole phase in water. And so um, they're really sensitive to pollution. Introduced species, um, for instance, the mosquito fish, um, they're really, uh, really a big threat to frogs because they do eat tadpoles. We've also got the wildlife trade, maybe not so much in Australia, but across the globe, they're really impacting our amphibians and also climate change which is um, going to have a really compounding effect on all these existing stresses unfortunately. So Australia's frog pressure, um, populations are really really troubled by multiple compounding threats like others across the globe. Um, at the moment we've got about 243 species of frog in Australia. Um, that's in including the introduced cane toad actually. So <clears throat> this number is continuously increasing. Um, perhaps most, the most highest profile of these is the gastric brooding frog uh, that lived in Southeast Australia and was declared extinct by the IUCN in 2002. That's the frog that's pictured there. Um, it's, that's a frog that's from our uh, museum's collection. And as its name alludes, it's a gastric brooder, meaning uh, the female's eggs developed inside of her stomach, amazing, she could turn off her stomach acids to her eggs, which is so incredible. And she gave birth to them through her mouth. That's pretty amazing reproduction strategy. And so sad that this amazing species is now extinct. 
the fourth uh, species of frog are extinct in Australia, and we have over 30 species that are threatened with extinction. And that includes the crabby frog, which is critically endangered, which is a status they're committed to as a last step before they may go extinct. Um, I'm going to share why we should care about frogs. There's a lot of reasons why we should care. We really want frogs to be around. They're really um, uh, beneficial to um, our environment. So they're very important bioindicators because they are inherently tied to water. Most frogs I mentioned have their tadpoles in water. They can also lose water very uh, quickly. So slight changes um, makes it really impossible for them to survive. So um, any changes to our environment, they're really intricately linked to that. And um, so when something goes wrong in our environment, they can, they can really disappear quite rapidly and, and let us know something's not right. And although frogs are, are small, they make up a huge part of our ecosystem and they're very important food source to other, other animals in the food web. So for example, lots of snakes and birds and reptiles eat frogs. Um, What's, what else is really important about frogs is that um, they really help keep our streams and waterways clean. So tadpoles regulate algal blooms and um, there is research out there that has shown the detrimental effects to our environment when, when, when tadpoles disappear and, and really they do have an important role of keeping our waterways clean. Another reason to care about frogs is maybe for our own um, benefit, but we're increasingly using the secretions and chemicals that frogs produce in their skin, which have antibacterial and antifungal properties um, to develop medicines and pharmaceutical agents. So um, that's one very important reason to keep frogs around too. And plus many of our species occur nowhere else in the world and they're really unique and really special to our country. So we should want to keep them around. So we started Frog ID because frogs are in trouble and they're very important. But unfortunately, one of the biggest uh, obstacles to conservation um, is our lack of knowledge of frogs. Uh, this is a graph of the known frog species we have in Australia. And over time, you can see that we're still going up. We're still discovering new species and there's still so much more to understand about them. Um, 16 frog species have been described in the last decade. Um, about uh, four different species were described in 2016, and this was one of them. This is um, the, the Cape York graceful tree frog, Litoria bella, uh, that uh, Jody Rowley um, co described and discovered uh, from Cape York in 2016. You'll probably see it on our Frog ID logo. It's, it's a very important frog for us. Uh, more recently, in October, uh, the southern heath frog was described to science. It was previously confused with the northern heath frog. Um, a new research revealed that populations uh, south of the Sydney basin actually differ in the, in the genetic makeup and their morphology and even their advertisement call. So upon this new discovery, we had to change all the frog ID information that we had and update all the, our numbers to, at the time it was 240 species, then we changed it to 241 total native frog species in Australia. So there's still a lot to discover in terms of Aussie frogs. Um, even more recently, uh, in February, I think, in two, um, this year, um, the, the Watchel and Rocket frog uh, was split into two different species. Um, as a result, uh, the Spalding's Rocket frog was re-recognised to science and increasing our total number of known native frog species from 241 to 242. Um, What's really exciting about this is that a frog ID recording from the Northern Territory was used to help describe this unique, uh, unique advertisement call of the Falling's rocket frog. And um, yeah, it's really exciting that new species are continuously being discovered. This is its call now. Hopefully you can hear it. Um, this is a map of all the frog records we have from Australia on the Atlas of Living Australia. Uh, it shows all the scientific records of frogs. Uh, and in any one area, there might be maybe 10 to 40 different species of frogs that you might be able to find in a short distance. 
Uh, but what you can see is that there are still some large parts of Australia that have frogs, but we don't have scientific records of frogs. So that's a real problem when we want to assess um, land use change and, and make decisions around conservation. We really need to know where frogs are in order to protect them. When you zoom even further, for example, in New South Wales, we realise just how much of this country has no scientific frog records at all. There's still so much we don't know about frogs and something really needed to be done to help address these key knowledge gaps. Um, back when Frog ID started in 2017, Australia had about 500,000 scientific records of frogs across the country, and that was since data collection began about 200 years ago. Um, this week, Frog ID hit 400,000 records, and that's a huge milestone thanks to all the citizen scientists using Frog ID across Australia. Um, huge, huge achievement in, in just under four years of Frog ID. It really truly illustrates what we can achieve with people power. And that's why we've made Frog ID. We really wanted to harness the power of um, people using uh, um, Frog ID to collect data on scales that normally is, isn't really feasible. Um, there's just um, too many frogs out there to count and, and no way that, that scientists and, and land managers can do it on their own. So with Frog ID, citizen scientists like you and I can help put more frogs on the map. The next reason why we created Frog ID is related to one of the neatest things about frogs in, and that's, um, that is that they call. And so you may wonder what, um, why frogs make that croak or bark or bleat from your backyard, pond or local creek. And it's actually a sweet serenade. This is a male frog's love song to attract female frogs. And the neat thing is that every species has a different sounding call. So you can identify a frog species just by listening. And so by making all these different noises, frogs are really revealing what species they are. And sometimes it's more accurate to understand what species it is by its call. Just to give you an idea of how, how, um, how cryptic our frog species can be, these are two related species of stream frog and a visual representation of their call. Their calls are are more different than their appearance. And I'll play you the calls now to show you the differences in how they sound. This is the Barrington Tops tree frog. The calls are a bit soft, um, but you can also listen to them on the Frog ID app if it is not very loud or try to turn up your computer sound if it's not possible. Here's a green stream frog. So male frogs call to attract female frogs and sometimes the call of a frog is the best way to tell them apart. Um, and frogs are really hard to find in the environment. I'll just give you a moment to look at this slide and um, just uh, look, have a look and see if you can find the frog that's present on, on this slide. Can you spot the frog that's in this photo? This is a photo from one of our PhD students, Gracie Liu, who's looking, uh, looking out for the Burlong frog doing some radio tracking on them. And it's right here. So frogs can be really difficult to spot, but they give themselves away by calling, which is really great for scientists and also for people using Frog ID because it gives us a way to accurately identify frogs without needing to really see them or disturb them or their habitat. So calls are really handy for species identification and that helps our Frog ID project because through calls, we can identify species really accurately. And not only can we identify the species, but we can tell so much more from recording of a frog call. We can tell breeding seasons, breeding habitats, uh, species diversity, um, what species call amongst each other, with each other, and even frog call variability within and between species. And another reason why we uh, created Frog ID um, is because we wanted to collect data on large scales. As I mentioned, the country is too big um, to sample by our scientists alone, and we really needed, we needed the community to get involved. So what is Frog ID? Well, it's an app-based program. Um, it is an app you can get from 
uh, for Android and iOS. We try to make it as compatible to as many devices as possible. Um, and it is mainly to record frog calls, but it's also a field guide. And I'll play a little video here of what it looks like. So it's got photos of frogs, um, what frog species calling around you. You can play the call. You can read their description and look at their distribution maps. Actually, these dis distribution maps are, are constantly evolving as we get more information put into Frog ID. So it's really an updated field guide, probably one of, probably the most updated field guide you can get on frogs of Australia. Uh, what's more is that the recordings are identified by a team of experts, which is what makes Frog ID one of the most uh, robust scientifically scientifically accurate data sets on, on frogs in Australia. So through Frog ID, you can um, open up the app and you can press record. And all you need to do is record the frog's advertisement call in 20 seconds or even up to a minute. But as long as that advertisement call is within that 20 seconds, then that you can submit it and it can contribute to our national database of frog calls across Australia. Uh, next, you can also select some filters. This is to help shortlist the different frogs that might be calling in your location. The smart app, uh, Frog ID app, uses your smartphone's technology to automatically apply all the information we need. And so you can help um, test your Frog ID skills and, and select what species you think it might be. Have a listen to different species think, oh, it might, might be that one, might be this one. Keep on scrolling through. And then you can add notes. Anything you think might be important for our team to know about the frog or its habitat, whether it was the first frog call of the year that you, for you, and then you can submit it. We really encourage you to check your folders as well. Um, this is where our team will I'll let you know what frog species is and you can check through your emails as well as they'll email you. So this is what the frog ID, um, the database looks to our frog call validators who listen to every submission made to frog ID. As I mentioned, the Frog ID app automatically applies all the information we need. Um, and our team have a look at this. They look at the date and time information. They look at the latitude and longitude. And they also look at the accuracy measurement that is taken from your smartphone device. So that's really important because sometimes our smartphones don't really know where we are. If we have an accuracy level of 3,000 meters. It's not as good as something that has an accuracy of uh, three meters. Just to give um, a bit of a summary of what happens to your frog ID data as well. So first you uh, record and submit frog calls through the, through the frog ID app that um, is then emailed to you. The species ID is emailed back to you and you can even reply to our scientists and um, dispute our records if you like, or you can say, oh, that's really great. And we share the information of the species um, with you so you can learn more about frogs. Um, you can also um, um, look at all the different frogs that you have called through the, the Frog ID website. All of these verified records are added to the Frog ID database and those verified records are checked and cleaned as part of a really thorough um, database um, checking quality control process that we have at, at the Australian Museum. Um, then all those records are made available on the Atlas of Living Australia and the Global Biodiversity Information Facility so that more people can use these records for conservation purposes or land management decisions. Um, yeah, so that's a bit, a bit of a summary of what happens to your frog ID data. We make it available to uh, different uh, national and global data repositories, and you can also reach these records on the frog ID website. So the next few slides, I really wanted to show you how diverse frog calls are and how amazing frogs are across Australia. This is the striped rocket frog uh, from northern parts of Australia. 
they have a really crazy call. Kind of sounds like a duck. Then from Northern Australia again, we have the Northern State Foot. You might think that sounds like an owl. Then we have the bleating tree frog, which is a, a common backyard frog on the eastern coast of Australia. Quite a piercing call and maybe not one that you want to be um, living under your bedroom window when you're trying to fall asleep. Then we've got the parents tree frog, also from um, very common species from the eastern parts of Australia. Oops, sorry. Let me go back. And lastly, I'll share another common frog, which is the Eastern Dwarf Tree Frog, um, Litoria phallax. Hopefully you were able to hear those frogs fine, but if you weren't, do reach them on the Frog ID website or the app uh, where you can play them. So since 2017, Frog ID has reached amazing milestones thanks to the thousands of people using Frog ID and, and listening in on their, and their calls. Um, we have received over 250,000 calls across the country, which is really amazing. And uh, we hit our 400,000th frog <laughs> this week, and that number is rising. We've counted 204 of the 243 frogs in Australia. So that's approximately 80, 83% or so. Um, so that's really great. We'd really like to record all the known frog species across Australia eventually. And maybe in the 10th year of Frog ID, we can reach a million records. That's our goal. So you can see that number of submissions have been going up over the years. And this map is a map of the grid cells across Australia and um, which grids have frog ID records in them. So the cooler colours are where there's at least one frog ID record, the warmer colours have more frog ID records. At the moment, um, our team have indicated that we are covering about 28% of um, the, uh, the grid cells across Australia. And really, we want every grid cell to have a frog record if we're really to inform frog conservation as best we can. So that's where we're at at the moment. This is um, kind of a, a cumulative count of all the species we've collected over the years, counted over the years. And you can keep, in, uh, keep a track on uh, all the species we're counting on our social media pages. Um, our most recent one being the, the whaling frog, um, which was species number 204. In terms of our most commonly recorded species, um, these are them. The Crinia uh, signifera, the common eastern froglet, was actually our 400,000th frog um, species recorded. Uh, and this is commonly calling right throughout Australia or most parts of the eastern coast as we speak. They really don't mind the cooler temperatures at all. And when we look across states, New South Wales is the biggest contributor, and that might be because we are based in New South Wales. We have a big media um, reach and relationship with ABC here. So lots of people hear about frog ID in New South Wales, but we also have a lot of contributions coming from other states and territories, Queensland and Victoria closely following us. Um, I also looked at the frog ID records in Canberra, and this can be reached for any region you're in, not just um, Canberra, but um, New South Wales, or, or even you can look at your, your uh, government areas um, across the country. And we can see that we've had over 5,000 records of frogs. Um, we've counted about 13 species so far, and there have been over 500 uh, participants in the ACT alone. Um, so you can reach these live records from the Frog ID Explore page on the website. But just to note, this is a live map that has species buffered. Um, so you will see records that have been spaced out like this um, buffered on the live map. 
um, and threatened species won't be displayed on the live publicly facing map just because we want to protect those locations and, and not um, entice people to go out and photograph them because a lot of people are doing that and really impacting um, sensitive frog habitat and breeding times. So do visit the Frog ID website on the Explore page is where you'll reach the live map and where you can download Frog ID records, which has the geolocations of the frogs. Uh, the next few slides, I'm going to share some frogs from the ACT region, just because most of you will be from there. But these frogs do occur across the East Coast as well. Um, so we have Crinia perim signifera, the Eastern sign bearing frog. So it's like a short, high pitched peep, uh, sometimes followed by a few different chirps. <laughs> um, this species breeds during any time of the year except the middle of winter. Uh, next is Crinia signifera, the common eastern froglet I've mentioned. Um, it's our, our most submitted species to frog ID with over 63,000 records of frogs. And this tiny frog species is often heard but rarely seen. It breeds during any time of the year. Um, and uh, the, the call really differs depending on the population. It's um, been likened to um, rubbing a wet finger on a balloon, like a really squelchy call. While others are a high pitched cheek, 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 like this one. Next is the whistling tree frog. Let's play the call. So it's similar to a whistling, a reet, reet, reet. Uh, it's a medium sized frog. It um, is really found in the alpine regions of New South Wales, ACT, um, as well as Victoria. And it can look to other frogs um, like, the, like the brown tree frog, um, but they really differ in, in their markings and, and their call. Another common frog that you might find in the ACT region and surrounds um, is the Eastern banjo frog. Oh. It's similar to a banjo string being plucked, a loud bonk. It comes up again. Nope. So this is a large piece oh. of frog. There it goes. <laughs> it breeds during spring and autumn, and it can it occurs in many different habitats, um, including woodland and heathland. So even in suburban areas. So this is commonly what we see hanging around in your near compost bin, um, oh. looking for grubs to eat. A really really great backyard species to have. Another common frog is the uh, striped marsh frog. So this. Uh, frog species sound similar to a tennis ball being hit by a racket, short and loud talk. Uh, it also breeds during spring uh, to autumn and occurs in many different habitat types. This species was actually identified by one of our research team members as one of the most tolerant of, of human modified spaces. So it's quite a common species we'll hear in our urban environments and, and see in our backyards. We've also got the spotted marsh frog. So this species um, kind of sounds like a machine gun in some parts of Australia. Um, it's it breeds in winter after heavy rain, so potentially you could hear it after some rain. Um, and it occurs in most uh, most water bodies um, as long as there's some vegetation around it. So quite another common species you might hear. Really cool species. Um, next, not so common, is the southern green stream frog. It's got two parts to its call: a really high pitched reek followed by lower pitch top. So uh, this species breeds spring to summer. So do keep an ear out. Um, 
if you're around vegetated stream areas, really, really important to record more of these, um, this species on frog ID because um, we're really trying to find out more about this species and a really similar looking um, species, the Cotter River uh, stream frog as well. So it occurs near streams and creeks um, and in sclerophyll forests, heath and rainforests. Uh, we'd love more records of this species. Another species we'd love more records of is the smooth toadlet. Uh, so this small brown frog uh, has a really low pitched kind of call. It's really tiny, only up to 30 centimetres in, in body length. And um, it breeds any time of year after, heavy, after rain and it can occur in, in woodland as well as farmland. Another very cool species, um, this was recently recorded in Mount Ainsley, if you're around northern parts of Canberra, um, the Sudels frog. A very cool, long, low pitch trill. So this is about a medium sized frog up to five centimeters. Uh, it usually breeds during late winter to summer after heavy rain. So um, we'd really like to know if this species is calling around you because they really do only emerge after when it's raining. So really good species to understand, understand drought conditions and if they're being impacted by, by that. Um, next we have the Dendy's toadlet, which is such a beautiful looking frog. These, um, these Sidophrony are ground frogs that have a really squelchy call. They occur in alpine forests and coastal forests. Um, you might hear them from drainage lines near small creeks as well. Um, and yeah, they're really, really interesting. The males of um, these ground frogs, these Sidophrony, they actually uh, they actually guard the eggs um, that they they have nests in muddy holes in the ground. Um, so the male guards the eggs until the tadpoles are ready to um, be released after after some flooding activity. And the tadpoles can take up to seven months to develop into frogs. It's pretty amazing. Another frog species of focus is uh, a real, really important frog because it's threatened and we're not sure how it's doing with um, drought conditions. And that's the Bibbins toadlet. It's similar to a squelch as well. So like other Pseudophrony species, the males of this species also guard the eggs in, in um, these guys lay their eggs in sphagnum moss or rocks and logs. Um, and they really have this amazing bright yellow on the tops of their arms and shoulders if you're lucky enough to see them. But whenever you hear a frog, if you think it's a frog, do record it on Frog ID. We really wanna increase records of these species. And lastly, I'll mention the Northern Corroboree frog in the ACT region, just because it's so iconic and it has a really cool call as well. So if you hear that in the alpine environment um, in ACT or New South Wales, do record it because it's a really, really important species we need more records of. Next few slides, we're really going to share uh, the scientific outputs of Frog ID and how what's, what's really been made possible thanks to all the, uh, the thousands of people using Frog ID across Australia and um, collecting you know, over 400,000 records of frogs. Um, one of the earliest uh, uh, research papers that the team produced uh, was really looking at the association of Frog ID um, citizen science records with species richness and actually compare this with expert derived uh, estimates of species distributions. And they really found that in 18 months or so, Frog ID really could accurately predict frog species richness at a scale compared 
to expert derived maps um, based on 240 years of data accumulation. So really, really amazing um, at large scales what Frog ID could produce and the biodiversity information that is just like a project like no other. Another interesting uh, research finding from last year was from um, 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 oh, Callahan and the team. Um, so that what they did was used about um, 126,000 frog records from Frog ID and looked at um, when they call. So they looked at this understanding that frogs call at night. Um, but what they remarkably found was that about one in five recordings of calls were actually during daylight hours. And some frog species actually called more when the sun was out than at night. So it really, really challenges this common notion that frogs are really mostly nocturnal when actually um, most calls during the day as well. Some species call during the day. So these findings have really important implications for when frog surveys can be carried out, for example, and also poses a whole new set of questions around just why some frogs um, call during the day. So some of the things that we are also in, informing and understanding more about is, um, is disappearing frogs. So for example, frog ID, uh, thanks to all these records of green tree frogs. Um, we've had a lot of uh, anecdotal reports of green tree frogs declining in the Sydney area. And it wasn't until Frog ID came along that we can actually provide hardcore evidence about this. Um, it's really concerning. We don't know why the green tree frogs are in decline, but for the first time, thanks to citizen science records, we can actually investigate this a bit further. And we do think that it might be because of domestic um, pets, but also maybe amphibian chytrid fungus playing a role. Sadly, green tree frogs are one of the species that are mostly impacted by the current outbreak. Uh, disease is um, likely to be playing a part there, but we really need more information on this um, from citizens, citizen scientists all over Australia, letting us know if they see dead and dying green tree frog. We're also getting a better understanding of threatened species thanks to frog ID groups um, on the ground. For example, the Sloan's uh, champions, they're out there using frog ID on a regular basis. Um, they're trying to understand the Sloan's froglet. And what they've achieved by using frog ID regularly is doubling the scientific records available for this species and, and trying to use these records to in, help inform conservation decisions and um, development decisions. We've also got a similar story in the northern parts of Australia with the Karanda tree frog, um, a critically endangered species where um, a, a small community group are using frog ID regularly to monitor this frog species as well. We're also getting a better understanding of introduced species, including the introduced cane toad. Um, this is really important um, to understand as these cane toads can be really detrimental to um, our environment um, and really harmful to um, species, native species that predate on them. So what we're finding is that um, we've got thousands of records of, of cane toad calls now and um, probably one of the better, larger data sets that can look at cane toad calls, where they're breeding, where they're establishing across Australia. We provide this information to uh, biosecurity agencies on a monthly basis. So it's really important um, if you're traveling in parts of Australia where uh, cane toads are breeding that you record them as often as you can. We're also getting an understanding of native species that are now establishing in areas that are not normally um, distributed. So for example, the Eastern Dwarf Tree Frog pictured here is now establishing in parts of Melbourne where it's not um, known to occur. And we're also getting records of this species in Canberra as well. So if you do hear that ratchet sounding uh, rick pick pick song of the Eastern Dwarf Tree Frog, do record it with Frog ID so we can better understand um, where these species are breeding and, and, and let the biosecurity agencies know um, so they can better manage species that are not meant to be there. One of the most important findings that we've had in the last 12 months um, 
and last 18 months really, is how frog ID is informing um, uh, frog persistence following the, the really horrible black summer fires from 2019 and 2020. So that immediate first few weeks and first few months following the black summer fires it's really important for conservation biologists and land managers to get out there and, 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 and collect data. But unfortunately, they really couldn't because the fire zone was just too dangerous. And also there was COVID-19 impacting travel restrictions. So it was really, really challenging for people that needed to get out there and collect this really time sensitive information. But luckily all was not lost because we had thousands of people out there using frog ID. And now we have one of the, um, one of a really great data set to look at the before and after impacts of the fire. Um, what's really warming is that um, all the summer frog species that were heard calling uh, before the fires were heard the following summer post fire. So that's probably one of the uh, rare good news stories you will hear about the fires. Um, we really need more records from fire impacted areas to understand the long-term persistence of frogs. We do have this study that shows us that in the short term, they, they are doing okay, even threatened species, like um, the pictured here is the mountain frog and the southern barred frog. Um, but we do need more people out there in the fire impacted um, lands to record frog calls whenever they hear them, just to understand if they were successful in their last breeding attempt last year. So this is the southern barred frog that was pictured from burnt habitat. And really, we won't know the full extent of the 2019-2020 fires. Um, we really need more records um, and we need your help. I just want to also plug that uh, there is a great project by the Australian Recovery Project, UNSW, led on iNaturalists. If you have um, some uh, other wildlife that you wanted to get identified and contribute to, uh, fire, bushfire recovery research, do contribute to this project on iNaturalist because it, it is also informing bushfire recovery and biodiversity recovery following these, these fires. So it's a really great platform. I highly recommend it. Really, really useful and really important for understanding fires as well. More recently, our team, um, Gracie Liu, a PhD student and frog ID validator, was looking at the impacts of urbanization, so human modified spaces on frogs. Um, thanks to this huge data set, um, Gracie was able to look at over 126,000 records of frogs um, um, on, on the frog ID data set. And she was able to find that 70% of species that we had enough records for, that we had enough data for, they were actually intolerant of human modified habitats. So it just shows what probably we, we all know that frogs are really sensitive to, to environmental change and urbanization. Um, but this is now really hardcore evidence of which species are most tolerant and which species are most intolerant. So the most intolerant species um, you can see pictured here, number 87, is the crawling toadlet from WA. And the most tolerant species uh, was the striped marsh frog. So we did see a pattern, or Gracie saw this pattern of more generalist species calling from vegetation being most tolerant and species that were specialists and um, laid their eggs on, on the ground, like um, the crawling toadlet, were really, really, uh, really intolerant of human modified spaces. So this is really great to, to understand which species we can focus on. We have limited conservation you know, uh, resources. Where can we really focus to um, our efforts to protect as many species as possible? And it's really an example of the uh, connectedness we have with uh, frogs and how we, we use our environment and, and how we can use frogs to um, understand how we are playing an impact. The most important takeaway from this research that Gracie did was that um, we really wanna keep our landscape intact. We wanna boost frog habitat uh, and we can do this through uh, frog ponds um, and frog hotels, if you like. You can Google frog hotel and you can get some really great ideas of how to build a frog pond and, and encourage tree frogs into your home. 
So Frog ID is really uh, filling these important knowledge gaps and putting more frogs on the map. Um, we're understanding distributions, um, where frog hotspots are, so we can really target our limited um, conservation resources, understanding breeding seasons and breeding habitats, because it's male frogs that call from, from breeding habitat. We're also getting understanding of which species need our help, which um, where we can really um, target our efforts, investigating the impact of drought and climate change as well as and, and fire, as you saw, and getting an understanding of taxonomy and new species, um, as you saw from the Spalding's rock frog that was used, uh, a frog ID recording used to describe it to science. Um, we're also using frog ID to re rediscover missing species and populations. So there was a population of the tusk frog in northern New South Wales that was rediscovered recently thanks to frog ID recordings. And so it's really, we have so many unknown and so many knowledge gaps of our frogs and we really, really can use frog ID to help address these. We've also got some really great government recognition recently. Um, the federal government um, uses frog ID records to understand the conservation status of Australia's frogs. Um, they also recommend the use of frog ID to monitor frog species. And also the New South Wales government recommends frog ID in their guidelines for threatened frogs um, and through their biodiversity assessment method. So really getting this recognition is really amazing. Even if you really know frogs and you, you are an expert at identifying them, we really do want you to record with Frog ID because as I mentioned, we want more frogs on the map and the more people using Frog ID, the better. Um, I'm gonna wrap up um, and just end with some points on how to get involved. Um, obviously we want everyone getting involved in Frog ID. Um, we, we really are here to help out with your app issues or anything at all. You can email us anytime. So do download the Frog ID app if you haven't already. You need to register a free Frog ID account and that really helps you um, get that one-to-one -one interaction with our scientists um, and they can let you know what species you've recorded. Uh, the best thing to do is visit your local pond, wetland or creek, um, usually in the dusk or evening or after rain and record frog calls whenever you hear them. Uh, as often as every day is great or once a month, as often as you can. Um, and make sure you click that submit button on the app. Some people don't do this and, and don't realize till a year later, we're always getting frog ID records submitted long time after they've been recorded. So that's fine. We really want all of these records that are on your frog ID app. So check your folders regularly to make sure they're all submitted properly uh, and do get in touch with us if you need. Some recording tips. It's really good to get as close as you can to the calling frog, of course, without disturbing the frog itself or its um, important breeding habitat. Um, you can just point your phone towards the calling frog and stop moving, stop shuffling your feet to try and um, be as quiet as possible pull the phone away from you. And um, sometimes it's helpful to wait for the frog to really get going in its advertisement call. It might take a moment or two um, because it realizes um, you're there, it might stop calling. So you might need a moment or two to really um, get the idea that you're not a threat. And um, yeah, you can submit multiple times and assess which one you want to submit or um, go around the creek and submit other individuals along the same area. Some common issues we've um, been um, addressing recently, uh, we have been seeing the remote area uh, or a location, location services notification popping up on Android devices. And this happens in really remote areas on some devices. Unfortunately, Frog ID uh, doesn't work so well on some older devices. But if you do see this happen, just try to cancel that notification and keep pressing that record button. Um, it should. Uh, after a while, understand where your location is and allow you to still record. And the frog ID recording will also be placed in the pending folder uh, and submit automatically when you're back in reception if it doesn't re record and submit at the, at the time of recording. So do let us know if any issues um, are 
are ex you, if you experience any issues on the Frog ID app, um, we're of course really happy to help. And it's really important that we know when the Frog ID app isn't working so we can better um, address this and better design it for, for everyone that uses it. Uh, I'll share some information about the Frog ID website. You can really um, visit the website to get some classroom resources or um, learn about the frogs. We have frog profile pages for all the frogs. Uh, you can also join a group. At the moment, you can only join one group at a time, um, but we're hoping to um, really improve this feature in the future. You can reach all your uh, frog ID submissions through your profile page on the website. And you can also look at the leaderboards. We have top froggers across the nation. David Dyke from WA is, has been the leader for a while now, almost at 10,000 frog ID records, which is amazing. And uh, we also have groups. So um, his group in WA is also top of the leaderboard, um, understandably, but also closely followed by the Blue Mountains frog friends and others. Um, frog ID is continuously being used by community groups. Um, these are just some examples. I mentioned the Sloan's Champions looking at the Sloan's Froglet. We've also got the Farm Dams Project looking at the influence of dams and um, to frog um, numbers and also their importance to acting as refugia for biodiversity such as frogs. And also the Frogs um, Victoria group. And there are other groups. And if you're in ACT, there's a Frog Watch group. And it's really, Frog ID is really value adding to these local and regional efforts on, um, that have been collecting frog and biodiversity data for a really long time. And so we're all contributing to the Atlas of Living Australia. We're all trying to save frogs. And it's really, really great to use Frog ID because it contributes to a national database. So we see some really great feedback. Um, these are really some heartwarming things. We love hearing from every, uh, people who use Frog ID. Uh, it's really lovely to hear from a farmer who said, I feel it, it is good to know what type of frogs are about and how they are going in the environment. And the health of my waterways through the property is important. It really keeps me in touch with species around me and can tell me what is happening to water health. And that's so true. We really do think Frog ID is making a difference. And we really appreciate all these really great feedback coming from the community and people from all walks of life. We've got Frog ID Week coming up in November. It's um, an event that happens every year to capture frog, uh, the frogs calling across Australia um, and really get an audio, audio shot of frogs on a national scale. So this is what our biggest event every year in November. Do get involved this year. It's um, occurring 12th to 21st November. We'll be sending out some information to different um, community groups on this soon, and you'll be able to reach more information on the Frog ID website shortly. Um, but yes, it's a great time of year to contribute to Frog ID and citizen science and build upon this year on year information that we're getting on frogs. Um, I put this slide in to remind me that if you do see any sick or dying frogs at the moment, do let us know by emailing the the calls at frogid.net.au email address. You may have heard that there's um, a current mass mortality event happening on the East Coast. We really need um, the power of citizen science to help us understand the extent of this mass mortality. Unfortunately, we're getting thousands or we're into over a thousand reports now of frogs um, and we don't know what's the cause and won't know until we can get our hands on on some specimens. So thank you for all those people who are keeping some frog carcasses in your freezer. We really appreciate it. Um, do let us know if you see anything unusual at all with sick frogs. They have been changing color. They have been looking thin. Um, they have also been appearing red on parts of their feet or, or bellies. And they've also been appearing to be sunbaking in the daytime, which is really strange as most of them are nocturnal. So I am wrapping up. I keep thinking I'm near the end, but then there are a few more slides. Um, the future of Frog ID, we really want Frog ID to continue for the long term. We really want to understand um, long term issues like climate change. We've got one of the best data sets to look at climate change impacts and we really need it to keep going 
to infer those climate change signatures. Um, understanding biosecurity uh, impacts as well. So frogs um, coming in from Southeast Asia and you know, monitoring the cane toad is a continuing important priority for Australia. Um, and we've got interest in uh, public validation, getting frog ID participants involved in public validation is really an interest to us as well as artificial intelligence, for example, using a large database of cane toad calls to look at um, machine learning and, and automatically identifying uh, calls of cane toads in areas where they're not established. We'd love to work with um, Indigenous rangers more and we've developed some um, early relationships there and really we do want to try and increase the frog records in remote areas and on private land and um, Yes, so if you hear of any opportunities, um, any partnerships, we'd love to talk to you. Um, we obviously want to keep Frog ID going as a free tool, as a free field guide to the Australian community as long as possible. Um, the more frogs we have on the map, the better place Australia is in understanding and, and protecting frogs. So thank you, everyone that's using Frog ID. The best thing you can do is share, share it with your friends and family and use it as, as often as you can. Okay. <laughs> I I seem to be stuck on the slide, but I am at my last slide. <laughs> Fair enough. We might um, go on and have some have some questions. Yeah, sounds great. So, okay, um, I'll run read out some questions I've pulled out of the um, uh, chat, and then if there's others, we can uh, we can work from there. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Michelle um, asked about frog uh, frog hotels. Um, is uh, is looking at how to do it without letting the uh, cane toads get in. Yeah. Um, any suggestions? Yeah, there are a few tips to help keep cane toads out. Cane toads are, are pretty bad at jumping, so if you do have a um, capacity to build a frog pond that's a bit raised, you can also um, cover the frog pond with some mesh as well to stop the cane toads from, from breeding and, and getting in there. Um, but the main thing that people do is raising those frog ponds to help keep cane toads out. Fair enough. Uh, and Stuart said, uh, if there is more than one species calling in the area, can the app identify more than one species from a recording? Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, uh, one of our team of experts listen to every, every recording. So they, um, they will be able to let you know every species that they can hear in that recording. Um, we love choruses of frogs. Don't be deterred by recording choruses of frogs at all. I think our, our record is 13 species in one single one minute recording. So um, <laughs> we record choruses of frogs as well. We'd love to hear them. Fair enough. Um, and Glenn's asked, and I think you may have covered a little bit later in the, in the session, um, but uh, does Frog ID work when you're not in um, mobile, mobile phone coverage area? Yes, Frog ID is designed to work in areas of low coverage and no phone coverage at all. Um, so you can record from these areas and then uh, submit them. Um, sometimes they'll go in your pending upload folder where you'll need to submit them manually when you're back in reception. Otherwise, um, when if they're submitted successfully, they'll automatically up, upload by themselves. So it's a good idea to check your folders regularly to make sure it's all in order. Um, but yes, it is designed to work in remote areas. Fair enough. Um, Margot's asked um, if someone is, is using iNaturalist, will the data end up with ALA? iNaturalist, yes, they have a relationship with ALA as far as I know that they um, all records on iNaturalist feed to ALA. So um, it is a really great platform. If you have images, I'd highly recommend ALA. Um, if you're curious about any frog images, uh, any frog species identification from just images alone, um, you're welcome to email us as well. We're happy to help identify those. Fair enough. <laughs> And I've got a question. Well, I've got some feedback. I've got a question. Um, you know, James has asked, "What's the difference between a frog, a froglet, and a toad, a toadlet?" 
Uh, so they're just common names. Um, the, the let part of it is really to um, describe smaller frogs, um, so smaller than the average frog. Um, but yeah, they're just, just common names. Okay. Um, ladies and gents, that's all the questions I've sort of pulled out, uh, pulled out of it. Um, unfortunately, the scouts have had to go and do their wrap up for the evening, so they may have missed the last sort of five minutes or so. Um, is there any other questions? Um, um, people are welcome to unmute and, and ask them directly. So what I might do... No, I had one, John. Stuart, All right, Stu. Yep. Um, how would you go about setting up groups? I saw you had with the um, sort of with the recordings or with some teams it looked like. Is that done through the website? Yes. So if you have a registered Frog ID account, you can go under your profile and create a group or join a group. Um, if you have any trouble, do let us know. Just email us and I can provide you some steps, but it is pretty straightforward in your profile page where you can use this drop down menu. Okay. Um, given that some people might be a little, little shy, I'll turn the recording off uh, and we can go from there. <laughs> 